You can listen to the Backward Compatible Podcast anytime, anywhere, in any way you like. Subscribe and listen to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Then, join the discussion. So they, they actually just straight up murder them. Yeah, that's, that's the idea. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim and Chris talk about crossovers, plus other topics along the way, including impressions of recent releases like Super Smash Bros. for 3DS, Hyrule Warriors, and Professor Layton vs. Phoenix Wright. The Backward Compatible.com podcast starts right now. <laughs> Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to podcast number 11. I'm Chris, and I'm joined once again by Jim. Hey, I'm Jim. And uh, we're doing another two-man podcast this week. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, we're going to open up again to uh, talk about what uh, games we've been playing recently. So uh, Jim, what have you been up to? Um, well, I've been I've been a little busy lately, uh, you know, job hunting and all that. Uh, so and getting my portfolio in, in a better better position. So I haven't been playing that many games. Cool, cool. But um, there's been a couple that I have played. Uh, recently, and uh, one of them is the new uh, Super Smash Bros. on uh, 3DS. Yep, same not, here. <laughs> yeah, just the demo, of course, because it's not it's not out yet. Actually, it is as of today. Oh, it's out as of today. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yep, yep. Well, that's. <laughs> um, do you actually have it already? I do. Um, I was actually just playing it before we hopped on. Oh, really? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm still not sure if I'm going to get it, but it's looking more and more likely that I won't be able to pick up a. Uh, a Wii U for a little while, uh-huh. so I might go ahead. I already have a 3DS, so I might go ahead and pick up the 3DS version and play that one. Mm-hmm. I've been playing the demo a lot, and because there's only a few characters, and I haven't really been able to play with anyone else, that says a lot about the game. Yeah, right there. I, I, that I, it is pretty damn fun. I totally agree. Um, I actually spent a lot more time than I expected with the demo. Um, it feels really good. It controls well in the 3DS. The graphics are just gorgeous. Um, I think they really pulled it off. Um, and then playing the full version, uh, there's actually a really nice, surprising level of depth to it. Um, lots of customization, which I think was actually kind of an underhyped feature. Um, the ability for you to customize your uh, your Mii Fighter um, and also to sort of tweak the balance of um, other characters either through um, items that adjust their stats, mm-hmm. um, speed, defense, attack power, or um, to adjust their specials a little bit. I, I forget the exact examples, um, but I think one is with Mario. Um, his fireball attack, you know, his traditional neutral B. Um, there's the standard kind of like, you know, bouncing fireball. Um, and then there's also a fast one that I think is supposed to like shoot out almost like a laser. And then there's kind of like this giant one that's supposed to do more damage, uh, but it moves slowly. Um, so there's a lot of ways you can kind of tweak your characters to play them however you want. Um, when you take them online, I don't think you get to use um, customization if you're playing with anyone, but if you're playing with friends or if you're playing locally, then I think you're allowed to use um, whatever custom characters you want. Oh, yeah, that's actually pretty cool. I actually didn't really play around much with that. I guess you can't do that in the demo. You can't customize uh, like Mario specials and all that. Right. Um, yeah, another regrettable thing about the demo is that uh, um, I've grown to like time to battles a little bit better now, but... Um, I really like stock battles better, so it's nice to be able to do stock again now. <laughs> yeah, I'm with um, you on that. I, I prefer stock, too. I thought it was clever, though, in the demo, because um, I, I don't know if you noticed, but they have the um, Omega form of the stage, the final form of the stage, um, for all the stages now. So instead of Final Destination being the go-to, is kind of like the small, flat arena that everyone likes to play on. Um, now you can have that same, basically, that same shape, that same form. Um, but for any of the backgrounds, uh, or any of the arenas, I should say, which is nice because it's you know visual change, musical change, it doesn't get as old as quickly. Um, but basically, you toggle that by hitting the X button and then selecting whatever stage you want. Um, and what was neat in the demo is that when you did that, um, it sort of made it tournament style, um, so that all the items were turned off. It was just the final destination form of the battlefield stage, which is the only one you can play. Um, and so you can kind of get both experiences in the demo of uh, kind of like items on normal versus sort of tournament style, no items, flat plane, etc. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm thinking of I'm, I'm probably going to end up picking it up anyway, just for like a new 
a new experience. Um, how have you how have you been uh, doing the um, co-op, the online co-op? Um, Not co-op um, versus. Oh, like playing you online. You can do either one, yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't actually tried online uh, proper, um, mainly because um, I can't connect to the internet here at school. <laughs> um, I'm on campus right now recording. The local multiplayer worked pretty well. There's a little bit of lag, um, like if you just connected on your local wireless network. Um, occasionally you'll have some slowdowns, but it's what's nice about it is that it's a nice sort of controlled lag when it does happen. It doesn't happen too often. Um, rather than having those skips um, where like, you know, the game freezes and all of a sudden you're like 20 frames ahead and like all the stuff happened that you weren't aware of. Everybody slows down in the same way at the same time. And so you can kind of um, roll with it. You know, it's not ideal, obviously, but um, when it happens, it happens in a um, more acceptable way, I guess I, you could say. I actually like that because it kind of going back to the to my retro obsession, uh, the NES used to have those slowdown issues on certain games where there was too many sprites on screen uh-huh. at the time. Yeah. So I know Mega Man was kind of known for known for that, one of those series that had a lot of different slowdown uh, shooters like Gradius and Life Force would sometimes have those issues. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, I'll probably actually end up liking that because I kind of, uh, I would always kind of enjoy slowdown because it normally would mean that something really cool was about to happen or yeah. was in the middle of happening. <laughs> yeah, gives you a little bit more time to think in a way. Yeah. Um, it actually reminds me a little bit of uh, the ramping effect they use in a lot of action films these days. Sometimes it's uh, not quite as appropriately timed, but it tends to be pretty appropriate because, you know, usually it's because there are a lot of particle effects or a lot of enemies on screen or something like that that's causing the slowdown. So usually something's happening. Yeah, I kind of hate that in action movies, to be honest. I think it kind of <laughs> ruins the experience. Same thing with the shaky cam. It's yeah. probably my most hated thing in action movies. It, it is a bit overused, um, both ramping and shaky cam. Um I don't, I don't mind them quite as much if they're used tastefully. Um, shaky cam is kind of nice in the sense that it gives you, um, and it's, it's what it's used for, I think it's used as a crutch sometimes, is that uh, it, it helps to add a sense of intensity by adding more motion to the screen. You know, the audience is kind of like wrapped up and um, in a way, you know, you might say negatively it causes confusion because they're trying to figure out what's going on. They're having to work harder to see what's happening. Um, yeah. But it's also, in a way, kind of an easy way to um, sort of censor um, some of the more hyper-violent things that can happen, especially if well, you're not trying to make your movie hyper-violent. Yeah, for me, first of all, I, I think if you have a scene that is hyper-violent, you should probably go ahead and show it, because otherwise you're kind of, there's kind of no point to even having that scene if you're not going to actually show it. Yeah. But uh, one of the things about Shaky Cam, when I think it's used right, is for things like um, you know, big explosions or moments where the characters are supposed to be confused because yeah. of like a sudden shock. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, like for example, Saving Private Ryan, I think was wasn't that the film that kind of um, started really bringing it to the mainstream. It might have I know been. They, yeah. I know they used some, and they used it very well because it was used sparingly and it was used in the right moments. Mm-hmm. The problem is uh, when I talk about action movies using Chicken Cam that I don't like, I'm really talking about um, in martial art films. Well, they're hot. They'll have hand-to-hand combat and suddenly they're using shaky cam and it doesn't really make any sense mm. to use shaky cam during fights or during like a warfare scene where you have um, a bunch of people that are just um, fighting it with say um, you know like a medieval warfare situation or they're just kind of shooting at each other shaky cam is not really warranted in that moment mm. unless there's like an explosion going on does it or, or like maybe the main character gets like clocked in the head and you have a shaky moment for a short period just to kind of you know, put it in his perspective. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense artistically. So it's uh, just kind of there to like save their budget. Yeah, and it feels really fake when they do it because you know that they're just doing it because they either they don't have faith in their um, choreographer to mm-hmm. to make an interesting fight. So they're like, well, we'll just kind of hide it with shaky cam. Yeah, or they feel like we don't have the special effects, the costumes, the makeup work to make this look good. Mm-hmm. So we'll just try to hide it, and it and it comes off very fake. I'd rather just see it and have it not look quite as good. From a you know maybe special effects, you're like oh well these aren't as good as they could be, but you can still see what's going on and you can still appreciate what is there as opposed to being able to appreciate nothing. Yeah, I can see that. Um, although I wonder if you're um, like, are you inherently opposed to say like handheld cam, so like not like super shaky, but like sort of moving enough that you feel like you're kind of like in in the moment. Okay. Yeah, the handy cams, I hate those. Uh, yeah, they actually okay. make, they make they make me ill when I see <laughs> movies that are mostly filmed like Blair Witch. I believe it was like fully handy cam. Oh, that's yeah, that's an extreme example. <laughs> but, well, yeah, but that movie, um, I actually couldn't get through that movie because it actually was making me sick. Uh, it was just constantly moving up and down, bouncing. Right, motion sickness. Um, yeah. 
yeah, and I don't see why you would want to watch a movie that is like someone's really poorly shot home video. <laughs> not on the why big screen anyway. Watch that? <laughs> well, also, Blair Witch Project is just not that good from what I understand, so. <laughs> it's really not. It's, yeah. it, just, it was different at the time, so people kind of freaked out. Plus, there was that whole... Um, the myth that built around it that it was actually real, which strangely enough, some people actually bought into initially. <laughs> nice. Um, so have you been playing anything else besides the uh, Smash demo? Um, yeah, I've been playing um, a bit of uh, Tex Murphy, trying to finish that game off, the okay. uh, Pandora Directive. Um, that's the one that I talked about in, um, I believe it was my last quick thought actually. Yeah, I think it was. Um, it looked interesting, I watched the, uh, the trailer. Um, so I guess this is the one that you're playing currently is a recent release. It's kind of like a continuation of an old series, a bit of a, um, not a reboot per se, but kind of a, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just kind of like a, you know, modern new entry, I guess. Yeah, actually, uh, first of all, I got the name mixed up with another one that I had actually uh, just bought from GOG. The one I'm playing is called Tesla Effect. Okay, gotcha. And um, it, it is the return of the character, uh, I believe, after... Um, 12 years I think was the last one that came out mm -hmm. uh, yeah the last one came out in 1998 Okay. so feel free to do the math yourself <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah so it's it's very interesting because it's kind of a jarring experience the way the graphics are, are, are set up mm -hmm. you have these 3D environments and you can tell the game is made in Unity by the way for anyone that's used the Unity engine because the <laughs> way that he interacts with the world mm -hmm. It's very Unity-like, and you can tell they, they use some of the, like, the, um, the built-in Unity scripting for right, things like yeah. climbing ladders and stuff. Um, <laughs> speaking of climbing ladders, oh, you get to a point, you see a ladder, you climb it, and you're actually, you get stuck at the top, and you keep going up, and every time I think the game is about to crash, and it doesn't, and you end up, it ends up kind of like pushing me forward after a while when I go up. But That's weird. It's, <laughs> it's because they use the, the very base Unity um, climb system, and it's not that good. You kind of have to tweak it, and they didn't really bother doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so uh, graphic-wise, um, and this is not on, on a slide on anybody's student projects, but student projects are done in a very shorter time frame. Mm -hmm. um, the, the 3D art in Tesla Effect feels like it's from a student project. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, more like a grad-level project, I guess, but it's. I, um, I know when I took um, some of the level design courses when we worked in Unity, um, and we only had about two, three weeks to do a project, we would do an environment that, honestly, I think the art was about the same level, at least for the ones of us that wanted to put the time in. Mm. It's less of an issue with the um, the models, which are low poly, but um, you can kind of hide that with good texturing. And the problem here that the texturing is actually pretty fast. Like, it's clear that it was done really quickly. Mm. and does, You can see scenes. Um, it's There's a whole like wide range of quality of the texture. Some of them look like they just took um, photographs of things, and other times it looks like it's a lower res version of a photograph or like a drawing. A drawing. Hmm. Um, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of consistency, uh, which is really it's really hard. I mean, I, I can't really stress how difficult it is to play when you compare that look to suddenly you go into say a space and now it's like a full motion video mm. of these two actors interacting. Right and. Yeah. And it's not that the gameplay is bad in the 3D space either, uh, by the way, because there's some interesting use of puzzles that I think is missing from a lot of modern um, adventure games, like The Walking Dead, like Wolf Among Us that we both played, which I feel, even though they're under the adventure game moniker, mm -hmm. they're really more of a narrative experience sure. and yeah. less of, of what we used to get, we used to call adventure game back in the um, the 1990s right. was it was focused on solving puzzles mm -hmm. and like get this item, use it on this thing to proceed. But yes, but but not just use the item, but also things like uh, you know like logic puzzles. Like there would be a, there's a whole bunch of logic puzzles that would sort of test um, if you've ever played a game like Mist or have you, have you ever played Mist? Uh, actually, I haven't. I need to. Okay, uh, but game there are a lot of games like that where um, there was a lot of logic based. Um, puzzles. Mm -hmm. Some of them with you know mathematical base. Some of them were um, you know memory games or related to like you'd have to look at something in the object. Like for example, in to use an example from Tesla Effect, um, you go into a room and you see these little um, they look like stamps of the tops of flowers, and you know that there's 
some sort of a puzzle because you can interact with it. But the game never never tells you how they want you to solve the puzzle. It's up to you to figure out, which I think is really cool. Cool. And so you look up over a, on a wall and you see, you know, kind of nearby, that there's this chart with different flowers. So you kind of put together, oh, okay, this is telling me um, the flowers on, and it's like on like a calendar basically. And then you you look at this chart and you say, okay, well, I, I know these have to connect somehow. How do they connect? So you say, well, this is a calendar. And you look at the little pieces, the little stamp piece, and you go, oh, I can turn them 12 ways. So it's like the face of a clock and a calendar. So maybe there's a connection there. Uh-huh. And eventually you figure out, oh, just kind of by like, you know, trial and error, thinking it through logic. You go, oh, okay, this is like um, January is at 1 o'clock and February is at 2 o'clock. And you set all the different flowers based on what they are on the calendar. And if you do that um, in the right order, it unlocks you know this little box and you get another piece of the puzzle that carries you on to the next part of your mission. So okay. that's the way a lot of their puzzles are. And it's something that you don't find that inside um, modern adventure games like Walking Dead, Wolf Among Us, or the Japanese equivalents like um, Phoenix Wright. The closest that we have now would be something like um, Professor Layton, right? Yeah, which has those those, but those that's kind of aimed at a younger audience. So mm-hmm. the puzzles are tend to be easier. I mean, not to you know down any of the puzzles in there, but sure, they sure. kind of give you an idea of what they want you to do. Yeah. they don't kind of throw you in there and go, "Oh, you're in this room, and this thing is you can interact with it, so you know you have to do something," mm-hmm. but you have no idea what you have to do. Well. I think that's kind of a more interesting way to approach it. It kind of challenges you in a different way yeah. and makes it more organic. Because if someone left out, say they have like a lockbox and they put some complicated puzzle on it, they have no incentive to tell you how to do it, right? Right. And yeah. it, it makes no sense. So mm-hmm. you kind of have to figure it out for yourself based on like, exploring the environment and, and that sort of thing. Cool. Um, yeah, actually, to touch on your uh, point about um, Professor Layton, I haven't played any of the um, core games in the series. Um, I've actually been playing uh, uh, Professor Layton versus Phoenix Wright um, recently. I just finished it. Um, oh, how is that, by the way? It's interesting, actually. It's pretty neat. Um, again, I don't, I haven't played enough Professor Layton to um, know like exactly what is and isn't brought to the table from that series. Um, but you know, you mentioned the puzzles, and my impression from this game, at least, is that they actually let you know that hey, it's puzzle time. Like a special screen that comes up, they explain like what the puzzle is and what the objective is for the puzzle, and you have to basically work it out. And um, some of them yeah. are pretty tricky, I have to admit. Um, uh, they do make you think. Uh, you know, some are tougher than others. Um, usually, they reward you accordingly for that. Um, but what's really neat about the the crossover is that um, you know I, I've always been a big fan of the Phoenix Wright series, but it can tend to get a little bit samey. Um, I think I mentioned this in one of my quick thoughts a while back that um, after a while you've played through like the first game, the second game, third game, etc. And um, the trials themselves start to have a very predictable kind of structure where, um, you know, just like to use a very vague example, um, the defendant, your client, has been accused of this thing. First, you have to basically... um, uh, make it seem like they couldn't have done it and usually that ends in you implicating that like you know someone else might have done it and then usually it turns out to be one of the witnesses that you indict and then you basically just grill the witness until you as the defendant essentially essentially find them guilty <laughs> yeah um now the trial doesn't actually call them guilty it just calls your client not guilty and then they get a scheduled trial for another date that you're not involved in um but so anyway uh what's nice about this crossover is that they actually change up the trial formula quite a bit um you're in kind of this fantasy setting Mm -hmm. and um there's uh it's basically accepted there that magic exists and that there are witches and all this different stuff and so you're having to go through these witch trials and defend your clients who um, have been accused of using witchcraft um and a lot of the techniques you got used to from the Phoenix Wright series, like you know checking for fingerprints and um, all this different stuff, uh, goes out the window because they don't have forensics. Um, it's basically it comes down to pure logic and trying to sort of explain things um, in kind of like medieval terms in a sense. Um, why, like logically speaking, this kind of led to that, etc. Um, so that's pretty neat. Um, it changes up. Um, so uh, I was just gonna ask, uh, do, do you ever pull the witch defense? Like it wasn't it wasn't my client; it was a witch. <laughs> um, actually, I think that does happen at one point. Um, Basically, you're, you just know that your client isn't the witch, and so you try to point out who might be the witch, um, which is always fun. 
Um, so you're basically accusing people of being witches. More or in less, a medieval yeah. environment. Okay, that sounds dangerous. <laughs> it's um, it's it's well explained in the story, but uh, so do people do they get burned at the stake or like? Uh, they get put in like this giant like Iron Maiden almost like not exactly an Iron Maiden, but it's oh, like this God. giant iron shell, and then they get dropped into this fire pit. What? Yeah. So they they actually just straight up murder them. Yeah, that's that's the idea. Wow. And it, oh. Okay. God. So okay. so do you it's care crazy. about spoilers? Um, no, if I play it, it'll probably be so long from now that I'll remember. Okay. Um, the, the small spoiler is that they don't actually get burnt. Um, there's like a little trap door. Um, and there's like kind of this underground movement that takes the condemned witches and turns them into, um, this other group. So, <laughs> That's um, kind of like the Disney solution to killing off the villain. In a way, like, yeah. Haha, just kidding. He didn't actually die. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's, it's actually quite interesting. Um, but then the other thing that's really nice about the crossover too, um, in addition to a few other tweaks with the trials, like they add the ability for you to cross-examine multiple witnesses at once, which functionally works a lot like um, regular cross-examinations, except instead of one person saying five things, it's each of five people saying one thing. Um, but there's some other little twists there where you can kind of like, when you press someone, um, someone else will react to what they say um, and they can kind of like look suspicious and so you can call them out on it and see if there's anything they want to remark on um, when you're pressing someone. So that's some neat little um, twist to the formula. Uh, but then in between, during kind of like the adventure, you know, visual novel phases essentially, um, the investigation we were trying to go around in the original Phoenix Wright, you have to basically investigate crime scenes and find um, evidence and, you know, trying to sort of talk to people, figure out what's going on. It tends to be very long and arduous um, yeah. especially when you've played through multiple titles in the series. But what's neat is that with the P Professor Layton edition, you actually have um, everything is paced much quicker. People don't say quite as much usually. And then if you're sort of like just uh, like tapping on different things in the in, in the environment, it will um, like have like a quick little blurb instead of like a full on like all the characters appear on screen and talk back and forth for a while. Um, so that's kind of nice. And then, of course, there's the puzzle solving. So you'll have puzzles that you'll solve in between. So the um, the the time between the trials is a lot more enjoyable now than it is in Phoenix Wright. So it's one of those things where the crossover really makes both series better, I think. Yeah, I mean, I let me ask you this, and I don't know if this, is, this will be spoiling anything. I guess mm. it kind of would be. Um, do you ever represent anyone that is actually guilty? Um, I'm trying to think... Because that's something that it's interesting. As Phoenix Wright, as a defense attorney, never really does that. Right. Yeah. It's actually very rare for a defense attorney. Normally, they're they're like ninety percent of their clients are actually guilty, and they're just trying to get them like the you know best sentence they can. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's an interesting theme um, in the series that um, basically, and I mentioned this in one of my articles too, is that um, narratively they keep reinforcing this idea that. Um, to be a good defense lawyer, you have to believe in your client no matter what. Um, and so no matter like how bad it looks, no matter how much evidence is stacked up against you, if you can, if you believe in your client and you know they're not guilty, then you can find that one little thing that's not quite right, assuming that they're not guilty. Um, and then essentially every time um, it turns out your client isn't guilty, uh, there might be some twists and some uh, like little things like that. Um, maybe they're like, you know, guilty of some minor crime but not like the one that they're um accused of um because right. it, it's almost always murder in these games um well yeah those are the more interesting cases yeah, exactly <laughs> um and like i think there was one time where there was a theft that turned into a murder case uh so that was kind of interesting um because yeah i played i played the first um three i want to say phoenix Wright games mm -hmm. the original trilogy for uh game boy ds uh, yes, and that was the one where after the third they, they did that one Apollo Justice. They mm -hmm. branched it off. I didn't play that one. Neither did I. Yeah. And I I played the first Miles Edgeworth spinoff. Mm. Was that any good? Um, I enjoyed it. They added some new mechanics to it. You they had uh, opened up kind of the investigation of the scene. That was the first time they opened that up. Okay. Um, so that I thought was interesting. The way you investigated the scene is a lot more um, organic. It wasn't just about talk chatting with people. Right. You kind of you kind of got to interact with the 3D space a little bit. That's cool. Um, so it was interesting. Um, I wouldn't say it was as good as the Phoenix Wright games, mm -hmm. but it was still, I enjoyed it. Cool. Uh, the other thing I was going to ask too, uh, while we're on the subject of Phoenix Wright, have you 
um, seen or are you aware of the Phoenix Wright uh, live action film? Yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> oh, you have seen it. Yeah. So it's gonna say it's actually pretty good. Yeah, it, uh, was, it wasn't bad. I was I was pleasantly do you know, surprised. Do you know who the director is? Uh, not off the top of my head, no. Okay, it's a uh, uh, Takashi uh, Miike. I might be mispronouncing his name, mm. but he's actually very well known for doing Itchy the Killer. Hmm. Like Nothing. a hyper hyper violent. Uh, uh. <laughs> film. Have you not? I don't know if you've heard. It's actually pretty well known for being sort of like a cult film. It's just very 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 violent film about this um you know these like there's these feuding yakuza games and this guy um itchy is this like you know really psychologically damaged guy who kind of um becomes this very brazen kind of like a um vengeful character but he he kills in this very um these very disturbing ways and he kind of kind of really pushes the envelope huh. so i thought he was a very interesting choice for the director of something like Ace Attorney. That's interesting. Um, yeah, no, I, I hadn't heard of that film. Um, but yeah, it is always interesting when you kind of get these directors who um, will kind of break out from what they're known for. You know, it kind of shows that an artist isn't necessarily confined to one type of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, there's some people like, you know, both actors and directors and even game developers who are kind of, they have their shtick. This is what they're good at. And pretty much everything they produce is going to be along these lines. Um, but it's always neat to see people kind of branching out. Um, you know, an interesting example, actually, recent news, um, or fairly recent. Uh, you know, Hideo Kojima is teaming up with um, Guillermo del Toro to do um, Silent Hill, which is really pretty oh, really? interesting. Yeah. Now, is that a Silent Hill movie or video game? Video game. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So um, seeing, you know, del Toro move into the game space, I don't know if he's done that before. Um Kojima. I mean, I know that before Metal Gear, he did a bunch of other stuff, like uh, Police Knots being an example. Um, oh, or yeah. even uh, Snatcher. You mentioned Snatcher, mm-hmm. Snatcher. at one point. Um, so he's Great done game. other stuff, but uh, you know he's kind of known now for Metal Gear. Um, so it's interesting to see him branching out again now that uh, you know Metal Gear is kind of his thing. Yeah, I think um, with, with Kojima, Metal Gear was definitely the, the biggest game that he was known for, but mm-hmm. he actually did a lot of different games. Um, I don't know if you've you ever played Zone of the Enders? Uh, I tried it, yeah. Um, uh, it has a really strong cult following. Like it's actually pretty popular. It's it's very niche, but mm-hmm. it's within that that niche, it's a very popular. That's the um, um, the one where you fly around in a mech, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, maybe I just didn't get too far, or I didn't get far enough into it. Um, I got the uh, HD remaster on sale for PS3 a while back. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's an interesting concept. I um, it didn't keep my interest for too long though. Uh, just because it started to feel a bit like a grind, and I just didn't find it enjoyable enough to just keep going with it. Well, it was it was um, strong enough that they actually um, created an anime series, twenty six episode anime series out of it. Neat. So it was a pretty popular series. They also did uh, Boktai. If you ever played Boktai, um, what type of game is it? It's an RPG, actually. It's a it's a more lighthearted RPG. It was for the Game Boy Advance. It was really kind of innovative because it used the um, like a photo light sensor on the back of the cartridge mm. so that when you would go outside in the light you would be like the world would be in the daytime I think I heard of and, this one yeah yeah it's really cool and it actually works pretty well um, there was a sequel that was made to it which I actually like a lot more mm-hmm. um, because the whole light dark thing while it's really neat initially mm-hmm. it kind of can get a little um, what's what I'm looking for kind of restrictive right so I kind of liked how they sort of went to this um they kind of changed it so that you didn't necessarily have to be out in the light. And I think that was with either the second or the third one that they started doing that. Okay. Um, let's see. Actually, no, it was with Lunar Nights, the fourth title mm-hmm. that was actually on the DS. And that was one I played a, a ton of, uh, which was actually really, really interesting. Pretty neat. Cool. Uh, but yeah, Kojima did like a whole RPG series. So it's kind of an action RPG series. So mm-hmm. yeah, he, he, he has a little more range than, than people give him credit for, but part of it is because Metal Gear is such a massive property. Yeah, it's iconic. In video games. <laughs> yeah, and so it's it's very hard to branch out and say that you, like, I really can only think of one other uh, game developer that is known for more than one franchise, and that's, of course, Miyamoto. Yeah. I can't think of any other, because it's one massive franchise, because it, you, it's so hard to have more than one of those big franchises that influence this game so much. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I guess another example might be um, Sakurai, uh, the guy who uh, runs uh, Sora. Um, 
he's done the Kirby series, Kid Icarus, um, Smash Bros. But but, he did, but he's only worked on some of those games. Like he mm-hmm. didn't create Kid Icarus. That was yeah, it's true. It's true. That was uh, Gunpai uh, Yokoi. Mm-hmm. I believe he also created the Game Boy. Yeah, yeah. So um, and and with Smash Bros, you've got he's using a bunch of pro- uh, properties from other creators right, that he's yeah. mixing in together. Mm-hmm. So Although, not to take anything away from the gameplay, which is different, but mm-hmm. he didn't he didn't create the the fervor behind those characters that sure. allows Smash Bros to yeah. exist. Yeah. So he's you know just kind of like uh, one of those people that's kind of like close to the example, but not nearly. I mean like him and Miyamoto like you know no offense to Sakurai but Miyamoto is like a legend you know <laughs> so yeah Donkey Kong Super Mario Bros Legend of Zelda I Metroid mean, I mean the list goes on and on and on <laughs> so well Metroid was actually um also uh Gunpai Yokoi as well right yeah I mean you know Miyamoto's always collaborated with people on I a bunch of different stuff um he was involved in Metroid though right like early on he was um kind of contributed somehow um, no, it was, I, I'm looking up to make sure, um, he might have jumped on in Super, because the story, and we won't go into it, because it's kind of out there, but the story of Gunpai uh, Yokoi is actually an interesting one, because he was kind of this, he was more, he was another one of the upstarts in the company, and he had mm-hmm. done a whole bunch of work, and then he kind of died tragically when he, when he was really young, mm. um, and so he wasn't able to continue a lot of his series, and he kind of, they had sort of built him up as like, the next phase of the company and it didn't really happen oh, okay. I think he got in a car accident if I remember right that's sad um, but uh, yeah he, he didn't even get to do um, Super Metroid by then he had already passed on so mm, it was gotcha. kind of yeah but he did Kid Icarus and Metroid um, but yeah no uh, Miyamoto did not really have anything to do with uh, the Metroid series okay but I might he, have been misremembering then yeah but he kind of had his hands in a lot of different Nintendo projects obviously the big three um, that he's known for Donkey Kong, Mario, and, and Legend of Zelda. Right. Um, and Pikmin more recently. Yeah, but he's done he's done a lot of uh, strange projects as well, and he's kind of been involved in a lot of other projects. Like I know um, he was involved in Star Fox. Mm-hmm. Um, he was involved. Like, he, he was a producer in a bunch of different games. Kind of helped shape them. I believe he worked with, and I think this is where you get the Metroid reference mm-hmm. um, for Metroid Prime when it was handed over to Retro uh, Retro Studios. Mm-hmm. Um, based out of Austin, Austin, Texas. Um, but yeah, um, they worked directly with Miyamoto to kind of make sure that the um, the Prime series still felt like a Nintendo series. He cool. wanted to have a Nintendo feel. And I think that's where um, the Miyamoto connection to Metroid came in and why you were thinking of that. Okay, that would make sense. Um, yeah, that uh, speaking of the feel, you know, the kind of that iconic Nintendo feel, that is very much Miyamoto's doing. I know he's um, a big proponent of like really pushing the game feel um, game feel being, uh, you know, kind of like how the characters control, um, mm-hmm. you know, to use the word to define the word, you know, the way it feels to actually play as them. Um, you know, you can really study very deeply Mario's jump, um, even as early as the the original Super Mario Bros. How um, the you know velocity going up and coming down, and the ability for you to alter trajectory in the air. That's all very important to um, kind of building what we now consider like an ideal video game jump. Yeah. Um, for a platformer. So um, even from the early days, he's always been all about um, really making sure that the experience feels good and is fun. Um, I forget exactly what he said at one point, but um, he talked about uh, when he was designing The Legend of Zelda and other games, um, Mario might have been included as well in this, uh, thinking of kind of like what are the core actions that the player is going to be doing all the time. Uh, I think it was like somewhere between five and ten kind of like core actions that each game would have um, and making sure that each of those was really fun and really like fully explored throughout the course of the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if, if when he gave that talk, but I do remember that as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we started we started talking about uh, Kojima's different project, and it kind of morphed into this whole discussion of different mm-hmm. designers, uh, which I think is interesting. You kind of can't start talking about um, well-known game designers without kind of mentioning Miyamoto, at least, because he kind of is the sort of the first guy who became like the big name, and then um, still kind of has a presence in gaming to this day. Yeah, so I think that's kind of, that's kind of where why we went that direction. Yep, yep. Um, but we did kind of, uh, you know, cross over from Kojima to Miyamoto, and I know you wanted to talk some about um, the idea of like franchises and games crossing over and mm-hmm. with others. I know you mentioned Phoenix Wright and, mm-hmm. and uh, Professor Layton, and Smash Bros. series itself is just is, is a bunch of franchises that are 
um, mixing and matching and, and coming together uh, to kind of face off with one another and see like who's the who's the ultimate Nintendo character. Uh-huh. Um, so, uh, what other crossovers have you played or do, do you enjoy? Because I know there's there's definitely some for me that I really really dislike and some that I think are really cool. Uh huh. Um, well, I will, I'll mention actually. Uh, I, I I played um, Professor Layton versus Phoenix Wright as you mentioned, um, and Smash Bros is. You know, even if people don't necessarily think of it as a crossover immediately, it's like almost a franchise unto itself now. So that um, you kind of just take for granted that it's a crossover. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I've also played Hyrule Warriors recently, which is one of those interesting crossovers where you um, take the the skeleton of a game or game series and then essentially reskin it. Um, yeah. And Dynasty Di- Dynasty Warriors, right? Yeah, exactly. Dynasty yeah. Warriors. Um, they've done it before um, with Gundam, at least, if nothing else. Um, and that was pretty cool too. Um, Hyrule Warriors, I think, is a really nice, um, nicely done game. You know, if you're if you never liked Dynasty Warriors, you're probably not going to be in love with this one either. Um, but it's a, I, I find it to be kind of a fun experience. Um, and there's enough kind of Zelda isms that still feels like a Zelda game, uh, even though it's got kind of a uh, <laughs> interesting sort of story, interesting presentation. It's very um, different from a lot of traditional Zelda stuff, um, cool. except for like kind of the core structure, if you will. Well, yeah, it's basically a, um, you know, a Dynasty Warriors game with a Legend of Zelda skin on exactly, it, which is, yeah. which is interesting. Um, I know I used to be really, really into the Dynasty Warriors games, mainly because um, I've always been kind of fascinated with ancient Chinese history. Mm-hmm. So to kind of I really liked the backdrop of the games and sort of being able to see a much, obviously, an over-dramatized version of um, that period in Chinese history. Mm-hmm. Um, so I remember I played um, Dynasty Warriors 3, 4, 5, and I think even 6, um, just multiple times, getting a whole bunch of different, uh, going through a whole bunch of different storylines, to the point where I, I kind of knew the story back and forth because, of course, they're all kind of telling the same story. They can only really put so much of a spin on it. Uh-huh. And that's kind of why the series just became very repetitive. So it's interesting that they can kind of breathe new life into um, some of their, their gameplay concepts by giving you a different world to explore and a different storyline and background and different characters. Yeah. Um, so I, it's the sort of game that I, I would certainly rent and check out if I had a Wii U, which I, I unfortunately do not. Mm-hmm. How many characters are in uh, Hyrule Warriors, by the way? Uh, let me think. Um, I know that there are fewer than your traditional Dynasty Warriors game, um, and they sort of make up for that by giving some characters multiple weapons. Um, mm-hmm. And not just, like, you know, weapons that you upgrade with, but, uh, like, totally different um, weapons. So, And do you fight differently when you have those different weapons? Oh, yes, very differently. Um, it's like oh, playing okay. a totally different character. So, uh, Well, then that's, that's great, because that's actually a big complaint with Dynasty Warriors. There's characters that pretty much fight almost identically mm. sometimes completely identically to other characters <laughs> so you feel like there's not a whole lot of reason for them to be there aside from just a uh, you know physical difference right the, the appearance um that's great that they're actually I, i'd rather have less characters and have them all be unique sure um yeah so there's link um zelda uh impa um rudo um darunia um agatha right. Fi, Gendorf, Zant, um, Girahim. I'm probably forgetting a whole bunch, but that's yeah. ten right there. Um, so I mean, it's it's still a pretty you know uh, meaty roster. There's quite a bit to it. Yeah, um, I just pulled up the roster here just to make sure we're um, we're not giving out false information. So mm-hmm. let's see. I'm gonna count them real quick. Okay. Seventeen characters. That mm-hmm. sound about right. Uh, yeah, I think there are a few that I haven't quite unlocked yet. Okay. Um, I wonder, though, if that number includes any of the um, alternate versions of characters. Like, for instance, Link, um, I think, has the most weapons of anyone. So he's got um, the Helion Sword. Um, he's got the Fire Rod. Um, eventually, there's going to be DLC that's going to add a Pona, which is going to be interesting. Hmm. Um yeah, no, this this doesn't include that at all. I, they're all they all look very different to me. Okay, gotcha, cool. So unless unless not does have both Princess Zelda and Sheik as separate characters. Yes, that that is correct. Um, yeah. But other, other than that, on this particular list, they don't seem to have um, anyone that to me stands out as being just a different weapon of that character. Sure, cool. I will say, um, I don't recognize 
a few of these characters. Um, a few of them are new to uh, Hyrule oh, Warriors. Okay, I, for a minute there, I was thinking, oh no, did I, did I, do I not have absolute Legend of Zelda knowledge? Yeah, you no, with me? that's uh, <laughs> no. I, I think your knowledge is sufficient. You were uh, you were only confused because these are new. So um, Lana being a notable one. Yeah, um, I noticed her right away. I was like, who is this? Yeah, who's this? <laughs> yeah, she looks way too happy. <laughs> Yeah, very happy to be uh, destroying hordes and hordes of monsters. So yeah, there always has to be that character though in a Dynasty Warriors game that is just ecstatic, like a like a bubbly teenage girl mm-hmm. who's ecstatic about like doing cartwheels and killing people. Does she, <laughs> does she do cartwheels? Um, she looks like the type that does cartwheels. I don't. I'm not recalling cartwheels specifically, but she does um, jump around a lot. Like one of her um, her main weapon is this uh, tome that she uses and. Um, one of her like special attacks is she'll like bring up these walls of magic and mm-hmm. eventually, essentially she'll jump off of them like do wall jumps almost ninja warrior style um to make them detonate and do a bunch of damage um so that she does a lot of like you know jumping around and um i think like you can get the special attack where you hop on this giant cube and roll it around over people so um it, it's a very kind of uh eccentric fighting style I also noticed that they included Agatha the Bug Girl from yeah. Twilight Princess as a playable character. Yep, yep. It's pretty <laughs> that's awesome. Kind of a, that's kind of an odd choice because mm-hmm. she's not really a big character in the series. No. Why do you think they chose her? Um, a couple of reasons, I think. Um, one, for the quirkiness factor. Um, I haven't actually played as her yet, but I've seen gameplay footage. Um, and her fighting style has to do a lot with basically summoning giant bugs that kind of like <laughs> pop up, do the attack, and then go away. That's um, pretty funny. But also because they they have this thing in the story where it, it kind of crosses time and space, so they have different um, eras kind of intermingling. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've got uh, kind of um, Ocarina of Time, uh, Twilight Princess, and Skyward Sword represented, in addition to the kind of um, quote unquote original um, Hyrule Warriors cast, because like this is a new Link and a new Zelda, all that. Mm-hmm. Um, so these they have like two at least two representatives from each of those games so from twilight princess it's minna an obvious choice um and then agatha because i guess they couldn't think of anyone else that would be either interesting enough or iconic enough from that game um Mm -hmm. i think agatha is iconic from twilight princess because you know there's the whole unlockable um or the the, you know you collect the golden bugs and bring them back to her so you'd interact with her quite a bit um and probably her her quirkiness made her you know kind of a popular character she she was definitely a memorable character i'll say that it was it's from twilight princess she's aside from midna i would say the most memorable original character well i mean zant there's also zant yeah who's also in there yeah I see that here. Mm-hmm. And let me ask, because one thing, that, like, the enemies that are in the game, mm-hmm. do they have um, sort of, like, boss characters from previous Zelda games? Do they have, do they have like, this Goma show up, just, like, mm-hmm. Horse Head or, like, Iron Knuckle? Yeah. Those um, sort of characters show up? Or? Yeah, uh, actually, they do. Um, if not exactly in their original form, then something close to it. Um, most, if not all, of your kind of um, memorable um, enemies, like, you know, just kind of standard enemies make an appearance. Um, as like you know, horde members, and they also have um, like for example the um, Lizalfos, those like fighting lizard guys. Oh yeah, those will be kind of like um, strong enemies, um, mm-hmm. and you actually have to lock on. Well, you don't have to, but it helps if you lock onto them, and they do like you know better attacks, take more damage. You have to like you know dodge and then like counter that sort of thing. Um, so they're like kind of these like you know not many bosses per se, but stronger enemies. Um, sometimes they'll be captains of groups and stuff like that. Um, and then uh, they do have like boss characters as well, um, if not exactly the same. Like I said, very much inspired by previous Zelda bosses. Um, mm-hmm. So Goma, that's the uh, giant spider, right? Yes. Um, so they have like a big armored Goma sort of thing. Uh, they have um, kind of the uh, iconic um, plant with four heads. You know, um, they have something yes. like that. It's called a uh, manhandler. <laughs> which is an awesome name. Um, I think that's actually that's actually the original name or close to it. Or is it Legend of Zelda? Let okay. me check. It's it's man. I always get the name. It's it's hard to pronounce because it's it's said in such a weird name, mm-hmm. a weird way. I think it is Manhandler. It's like Manhandler or something. Yeah, it is. Man-handler. It's spelled like it's it's spelled like Manhandler essentially. <laughs> yeah, it's, and it was a it was in the very first Legend of Zelda. Okay. So um, it's, it's, a, it's definitely a classic character. I, I remember seeing it before in um, Four Swords, but I actually never played all the way through the original Legend of Zelda. Oh, so. it's in a lot of different games okay. in, in Zelda series. So yeah, it's in Four Swords, it's in 
Um, it's in a whole bunch of them. So mm. yeah, I, I can totally see that. And sometimes they redesign it to look a little bit more um, like a giant plant mm-hmm. as opposed to it kind of looks more like um, just like a weird body shape with four mouths on the side, like four pincer mouths okay. in, in the first Legend of Zelda. Uh-huh. And so it kind of morphed into a more plant-like creature as the series went on. Gotcha. Cool. Um, yeah, so there, there are a bunch of other bosses. And then, of course, there's all the... Um, uh, you'll fight with other sort of like player characters or people that eventually become player characters, um, like you know Gearheim and Zant and Ganondorf and all that sort of stuff. So, so let me ask you this: mm-hmm. um, what what character would you say is like the most glaring omission from play the playable characters? I mean, uh, well, I'm trying to think if there's anything that I'm missing in particular. Um, I think it would have been neat to see a couple more of the um, the people from uh, Twilight Princess in there. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, I believe there's DLC packs coming out. I don't know if necessarily to add from um, Twilight Princess or anything else specifically. Um, but I think, like for instance, there's a Majora's Mask pack coming out. They haven't announced what's in it, but I'm hoping that uh, maybe uh, the Deku Kid will be in there. Okay. Um, or the Skull Kid, that was his name. Yeah, Skull um, Kid. And then maybe an ability for Link to have, like, you know, the mask so he can transform into other things. Um, as far as people that are missing, I can't, none, none actually come to mind. Um, really? Not, none at all? Yeah, not even I mean, one that had, a, had his own spin-off series? Well, spin-off game. Uh, well, Tingle's not in there. <laughs> oh, I mentioned it. <laughs> I, I actually can't stand Tingle, but I just wanted to see if you'd bring him up. Right. As a character that's missing. <laughs> I, I wasn't even thinking of Tingle until you mentioned the spinoff. I was like, oh, I, I, yeah, I you, Zelda, you were baiting me into mentioning I think, Tingle. So. I think Zelda fans try not to think of Tingle, so that's probably why. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, He's one, actually, Vati is another that I, I, I was a little bit... A little bit surprised that he wasn't mm, there. He was that's a good a point. Pretty, yeah. A pretty big uh, villain in um, the handheld games. Mm-hmm. He showed up in a couple of them. Yeah. So yeah. he's one character that I think they maybe could have included. Um, I can kind of understand why they didn't because they were kind of aiming it more towards the um, more recent Zelda games. It seems. Mm-hmm. So that I kind of understand. It. I or mean, um, like, if not recent inherently um, or necessarily, I think um, 3D. So the the 3D kind of like console flagship games. Um, yeah. I think that's kind of what they were targeting with this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see that, and uh, which is fine. I just I do think it'd be interesting to include some of the older characters. Like I know there were definitely some, particularly from some of the ones that I played, like Adventure of Link. Uh, being, being I'm, I'm kind of a big Adventure Link fan, mm-hmm. as, we've, as we've been over before. Yeah, yeah. but uh, but there's definitely some characters from there that I think could have been, if not playable, that might be interesting. Um, Villains that they could have thrown in. Sure. Same thing with Link's Awakening. I think the the Game Boy title. If you've ever played that one, um, they a, had some, a little bit. Yeah. They had some creative villains in there mm-hmm. that I think they could have sort of imagined as um, maybe bosses in certain levels or um, special fights, kind of like they did with Doma. Mm-hmm. Might have been an interesting addition. But of course, I mean that's what DLC packs are for, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, and there's some interesting, uh, they kind of embrace the fact this is a non-canonical Zelda game, so they kind of go over the top with some of their presentation things. Um, a fun little example is, uh, I forget if it's part of a specific um, weapon set, it might be the um, the ball and chain, like Link gets um, the power gauntlets plus um, oh. the ball and chain, so he's able to like swing this massive ball and chain around um, and like punch enemies with these giant gloves. Hmm. Um, so I think there might be a special attack with that one where he uh, uh, actually takes a hook shot and pulls down the moon from Majora's Mask as an attack. <laughs> um, and it, it's shrunk down immensely, but it's still just kind of a funny uh, little thing that happens. Um, uh, one of the special attacks for uh, Lana, actually, when she's using her um, Deku Spear um, as an alternate weapon, uh, she's able to summon um, the Deku Tree, and basically that's the giant attack that... Uh, takes out a bunch of enemies right in front of her so um you know sometimes it's, uh, it seems a little bit ridiculous but by the time you get to those more ridiculous like special moves and stuff like that you've kind of gotten over the fact that this isn't you know a traditional zelda game and so you don't really care anymore not that i ever really did um but you know even like seeing trailers and stuff like that I'd see some of those moments like okay that was weird <laughs> you know um so but it's fun it's a it's a cool game cool interesting so that's and, and this you would you would describe it as a crossover in terms of um, not franchises but 
the gameplay being crossed with another franchise. Yeah, um, and actually another really good example of that um, that's uh, it came out a couple of years ago, um, but I think they're making a new version now. I'm not sure when it comes out. Um, it might already be out. I'm not sure. Um, but Persona 4 Arena um, was developed by the same guys who did uh, Blaze Blue, Guilty Gear, all that. Um, mm-hmm. But it takes the Persona 4 and actually Persona 3, a bunch of characters from there are um, in here, um, into this fighting game. Um, and so it's got like kind of aesthetically... Um, it gets drawn a lot like uh, Blaze Blue and all those, where it's kind of like sprite, sprite, excuse me, sprite based. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, you know, obviously bring their fighting game expertise to the to the party. Um, but then there are a bunch of mechanics that are specific to Persona Four um, or this particular game, even if they're not directly translated from the game. I think they're inspired by the Persona series. Yeah. Um, the idea that like there's certain things that you build up, um, certain things that you can expend. Um, it's been a while since I played it, so I can't name all the subsystems. But um, some really, yeah. some really I, neat I've, stuff. I've actually never played it, so I. I... You know, I I had heard of it, but I really hadn't looked into what sort of game it was. Um, I just thought, I guess I got it mixed up with the um, the Persona Four um, like remake slash uh, port that Golden. they took to the yeah yeah. Because I played a lot of Persona Four, but I played it on the uh, PS2 and mm-hmm. really enjoyed it. So I wasn't really interested in the various um, updates. I didn't really think it was necessary. Sure, yeah. Um, so I didn't know this was a completely different game. Apparently, mm-hmm. totally different style. That's yep. interesting. Yeah, it's uh, it's really cool, and I think one of like kind of the most obvious things that you'll see um, Persona bring to this you know two D fighter is the idea that um, every character has their persona in the fight as well. Um, so you have like you know kind of like a quick attack, a strong attack, and then also a quick and a strong attack for your persona. Um, so the four face buttons, like half of them are for your main character, half are for your persona, and you can do some really interesting um, strategic things as far as uh, like each one sort of behaves differently. Um, and you know the the really pro level gamers are going to sort of treat the two characters as the same one, um, as I think is intended. Um, but it's kind of neat how you can um, essentially feel like you're playing two characters at the same time in a pretty easy way, even for someone like me who's just a uh, you know kind of a um, educated button masher you know kind of like we have educated guesses it's not just like a stupid <laughs> random guess but like you know you kind of you figure some things out you draw from some background knowledge and you try to sort of apply it mm-hmm. um so i'm i'm an educated button masher and uh that's always been and probably always will be my level of uh fighting game expertise so have you ever played have you played this on um the ps4 or have you actually played the arcade version uh not or the PS3, arcade um uh, yeah i played it on ps3 um rented it for a while and then um went back and bought a used copy later on um because it was just a really cool game so hmm. yeah i find it interesting that apparently it also came out on the uh the xbox uh 360 okay even though the persona series um is a sony exclusive as far as i can tell i think hmm. that's more because they may be helped pay atlas for it or i don't know if sony didn't make it yeah maybe um it could be too that because it was being developed um by uh i forget their name but the studio that did those other games i mentioned arc system works Mm -hmm. um i think i think their games have also been on um xbox and so it was kind of just uh um all right like the more recent ones like blaze blue i think were cross-platform so they just made this one (laughs) cross-platform as well (laughs) yeah actually they're um guilty guilty gear is their um, their big one, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, that one was always uh, cross-platform. And in fact, um, the Guilty Gear that was on uh, the Dreamcast was kind of like the big one of the big games. That was kind of the one that I think kind of put them on the map. Okay. Oh, and quick correction for mm-hmm. those that are it, it will annoy. Uh, I meant Guilty Gear X. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> In case someone's like that one was on the Dreamcast. Okay, gotcha. It's Guilty Gear X. That was the one, but that was the big one that kind of. You know, made because I remember the original Guilty Gear was not that big, and it was really X that kind of put them on the map, at least from what I remember when I was playing these. Mm-hmm. Partially because, um, you know, X was also in the arcade, and the original Guilty Gear was not in the arcade. So. Mm-hmm. Cool, cool. Um, so it seems like actually um, fighters are one of the most natural genres for crossovers. Um, you know, like if I'm sort of just like listing off all the crossovers I can think of, a lot of them are fighters. Um, yeah. Versus Capcom being like kind of its own series in a sense, even though it's got different things versus Capcom. Um, the gameplay always seems to be um, essentially the same style of a Capcom fighter, if you've noticed that, um, kind of like Street Fighter-esque. Um, 
Which, where, which games? I'm uh, sorry. It, like, you know, Marvel versus Capcom, um, pretty much anything else versus Capcom. Well, it's um, because if it's developed by Capcom... They're going to make it their way, yeah. Yeah, and I think that there's that, but there's... There's also that, um, you know, the SNK kind of SNK kind of has their own style too. Mm-hmm. So, which is why um, you know, it's very interesting when you have. I don't know if you've ever played the uh, the Capcom versus SNK. Uh, no, I haven't. Um, it's actually fantastic and probably the the best example of these crossovers because they kind of had, um, I think, the kind of the the highest level of, of um, the you know the most complex gameplay, the, the kind of the best fighting gameplay. Mm-hmm. They sort of hit that with Capcom versus SNK too. Um, but uh, but the interesting thing with that is that they kind of allow you to pick um, your fighting style, which I believe uh, they called it a groove, mm. and it sort of changes the way that you play, and the grooves are sort of based on um, SNK series or Street Fighter series. Okay. So you've got grooves that are from um, you know a couple of the you know King of Fighters, which is kind of SNK's big series, mm-hmm. and then you have some that are based on Street Fighter, which is the you know Capcom series. Right. So it it kind of gives you um, in a crossover game, two different ways to play, mm-hmm. which I thought was an interesting thing. They don't really explore that in other crossover series, uh, maybe because not all of them are from different fighting games. Uh-huh. I don't know. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I also played uh, a while back um, Street Fighter Cross Tekken, um, yeah. which is another one where they kind of took these Tekken fighters, and I think they did an admirable job of trying to like work in some ways the Tekken fighters feel and play differently than the uh, Street Fighter characters, but mm-hmm. essentially they're still being moved from their traditional 3D space into a more 2D Street Fighter style um, type of game. Um, and I don't know if they're still working on it, but I remember when they announced that project, they were also intending to work on a um, Tekken cross Street Fighter. So it's basically the same thing reversed, where it would be Street Fighter guest appearing in a Tekken style game. Um, yeah, which is actually really uh, really intriguing to me because I'm curious to see how Street Fighter characters would look and feel in a non-Capcom style game because we've only ever seen them in Capcom style games. Um, well, speaking of that, I just looked it up real quick, and apparently in 2014 um, at the San Diego Comic Con, uh, it was actually announced that the game was still in development. Okay. So apparently they're um, looking for quote uh, the right opportunity to market it. Okay. So I don't know exactly what that means. Maybe that's marketing speak for they don't have the money to, to publish it right <laughs> now. I because it is Bandai Namco. Um, mm. I thought they were in pretty good financial shape, but who knows? You know, it, it, it could just be timing. Um, it could be they're waiting a little while until there's kind of a more of a demand for a fighting game like that. Um, reason being that um, Namco is teaming up with Nintendo for the most recent Smash Bros. Um, and so right. Namco probably doesn't want their own product to compete with their own product. In Smash Bros, um, and so they're probably going to wait a little, little, wait a little while, kind of let the market die down a little bit, and then probably see kind of like, oh hey, we can hype this up now. Well, speaking of uh, Namco and, and Capcom crossovers, have you played uh, the Namco X Capcom uh, role playing game? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, although I did try a little bit of the uh, Project uh, Cross Zone, Project X Zone, whatever it was called, on the yeah. um, 3DS, um, which I kind of got the impression it was similar in a lot of ways. Um, I actually have not played it, but I'll look it up. Uh, real X, yes, Project X Zone. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, yeah, it seems like it is. It's all it's a uh, tactical uh, role playing game, which mm-hmm. is pretty much what the Namco um, X Capcom was. Although there were like actiony elements to it, so mm-hmm. it kind of has like this sort of hybrid. Yeah, in the um, um, in the fights, you actually can uh, you've got like team ups between different characters, and you can sort of choose what attacks you want them to use. Mm-hmm. Um, and it feels. You know, a little bit more like an action game, like you mentioned, because there's kind of like this button mashy element to it. I only ever played the demo, um, but you know, I, I'm I'm a bit of a sucker for crossovers, even if they're not particularly good. I sometimes just find them interesting because they're crossovers. Um, so this one was really intriguing to me because it was Namco and Capcom and Sega, um, all contributing characters. Yeah. Um, and it was just like this big, massive, like I don't know how many characters there were in the game, but just a lot. <laughs> so, is this does this have a um, like a big story mode, or is it more of just a whole bunch of tactical battles? I, I think there is a story mode, but it's you know it's essentially just like um, stringing you along a series of tactical battles, um, you know, over the course mm-hmm. of this story. And in crossovers, I notice stories tend to be um, fairly contrived, you know. Um, 
like some portal between dimensions is opened and there's this like generic enemy that's come out of nowhere that um we all need to work together they're bringing them down and then gameplay <laughs> so it's uh you know it's kind of just whatever gets the job done i suppose yeah i've been looking these up as we've been going along to try to make sure that we're keeping um giving out proper information not mm -hmm. any misinformation um and i can't help but notice that on all these different crossovers that we talk about i scroll down and i look at the ratings and you know there's they're usually like between average some of them are good mm -hmm. and it's always games radar that gives it like a two out of five or like a 1.5 <laughs> out of five i don't they must really hate crossovers huh nice um, although what's interesting um, is that the ones that tend to be um, a little bit more story driven, I think, do a pretty decent job of um, uh, having more thoughtful stories. I think, uh, for instance, Professor Lane versus Phoenix Wright, both of those are very you know nar narrative heavy games because they're essentially visual novels with occasional gameplay elements, uh, puzzle solving elements. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that um, level five, the developers of Professor Layton, and they had a lot of people from Capcom working on it too. Um, I think they really put a lot of good effort into making sure that there was a, um, a setting and a scenario that would kind of like play to the strengths of the both characters. And um, uh, even if it seems a bit contrived at first, um, without spoiling too much, everything is kind of explained by the end. And it's like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So um, there's actually a lot more, um, a, a lot more to that game's story as compared to a lot of the crossovers that I've seen. Yeah, I, and you know, still speaking speaking of crossovers, I know we've we talked a lot about um, fighting game crossovers because those are kind of the big ones. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm kind of looking at the list here, but I'm curious to see which crossovers that are that are non-fighting game related do you think are kind of, you know, aside from Phoenix Wright, like Professor Layton, which we talked about, mm -hmm. um, which would you say are the most interesting or maybe, I don't want to say best because it's mm -hmm. kind of more subjective, but what do you think are the most interesting or maybe they, they cross over the best, that kind of mm -hmm. the best fit? Um, I have not played a ton of it, but I'm really intrigued by Kingdom Hearts. Um, mm -hmm crossing over uh, Square Enix, especially Final Fantasy, with uh, Disney. Um, <laughs> which is just like the weirdest combination I've ever heard of, and yet it works really well um, from what I've seen. Yeah, that's um, why I couldn't get into it. Same sort of thing. <laughs> like I just, just I couldn't wrap my head around that concept of mm -hmm. all these Disney characters that all, that all have their own separate worlds mm -hmm. are mixed in with you know Final Fantasy characters, and they kind of have this sort of the, the new age classic Final Fantasy story, which is, I guess, becoming a classic now, which I've never really liked the newer Final Fantasies. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of killed it for me right away. <laughs> but uh, but maybe you'd like, I, I have no idea. I, they are certainly popular games. They, mm -hmm. they definitely have found their audience. Yeah, um, I haven't played a ton. Um, I've tried picking up a couple and getting into them. Um, I think I just kind of lose my momentum a lot of times and don't have time to, or really the motivation to get back into them. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, the, the, the combat systems tend to be pretty cool. Um, it's more of an action RPG um, than like a straight up kind of like turn-based RPG, which is pretty neat. Um, and I know there are a lot of people who really get into the story, really get into all the characters, partially because, you know, if you're a big fan, like you, you, know, if you grew up with Disney films and stuff like that, you're going to be a big fan of like, oh, now I get to go see this world and that world. And, um, you know, it can be pretty neat in that sense. Um, and actually, speaking of um, Final Fantasy crossovers, um, it's also a fighting game, but uh, Dissidia Final Fantasy. Um, yeah, I and, and that's when I, I played a, um, a demo of that, but... Um, I haven't. I never actually owned the game. Mm -hmm. I thought it was an interesting concept to to turn an R RPG, a series of RPGs, into a fighting game. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it worked really well, actually, because um, it, it's not like a traditional like two D or three D fighter where you like have two people squaring off in like a smallish arena um, mm -hmm. and kind of like circling each other. You actually have relative freedom of movement um there's a lot of kind of like you know flying through the air and stuff like that um it, it reminds me more of a um i don't know if you've played any of the uh 3d dragon ball z fighters um yeah, Budokai Tenkaichi. Mm -hmm. um it reminds me more of those in a lot of ways plus a lot of rpg elements which being final fantasy um working rpg elements into it um is kind of a cool way to sort of make it feel more like a final fantasy even though it's a fighting game um so I thought that that was a really well done um, crossover as well. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, it's one of those that you know, if, if I was handed it for free, I'd play it to try it out. But I'm not interested enough to actually buy it. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it is interesting that they decided to go there. Um, another one that kind of 
you know, I'm, I'm kind of looking at this list to try to refresh my memory. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm noticing there's a lot of uh, racing games that kind of have crossovers mm-hmm. and extra yeah. characters. And like Mario know, Kart. And, yeah, Mario Kart is, of course, um, a bunch of Nintendo properties. Sega kind of All-Stars. Like and Sega all those. All-Stars, yeah. It's, I think it was like Sonic and Sega All-Stars Race. Yeah, yeah that's what yeah, it was. Sonic and Sega. Yeah, so they, they have that with a, kind of a Sega version. There was, I know, a um, Donkey Kong racing that took... Although, I don't know if I'd consider that a crossover, because I think that was all... Donkey Kong related characters, wasn't mm. it? I think I think you might be right, or original characters created for the game. Yeah. Um, I can't think of any that came from other series, but I could be wrong. Yeah, and of course, um, we're also uh, forgetting. I don't know if forgetting is the right word. We're probably just choosing not to mention the the PlayStation All Stars uh, game. Oh yeah, no, I didn't even think of it. Yeah, no, I mean that that's that's a crossover, it, but it, it's one it, of those it was that uh, very forgettable because it was just like kind of a. Let's take Smash Bros. and just throw our characters in it. Yeah, and, and kind of change it, it enough that it's not a total rip off of Smash Bros. Essentially, it was a total, it was a total rip off of Smash Bros. <laughs> let's, not, let's not kid ourselves here. Uh, I, I haven't played it, so I can't judge. So it's it's okay the first few times, and then you kind of realize that the character, like the gameplay, is is actually not as good as Smash Bros. for starters, but mm-hmm. also the characters are just not as diverse and interesting. Mm-hmm. And I think that kind of is what holds back. Um, because you know what is who are the characters that Sony has that can compete with the Nintendo characters in terms of recognizability and yeah, yeah. Um, you know what do they have like I'm looking some of the characters here they've got like Parappa the Rappa like <laughs> Sweet Tooth Sly Cooper I mean yeah. these are I these mean, are characters and, and some of them were you know kind of like you know good iconic characters from very good games but yeah no I think like even Sony's best like just kind of pale in comparison to Nintendo's best you know mm-hmm. um and uh, like you know, Sly Cooper, I was aware of. You know, they had Ride In coming from the Metal Gear Rise or Metal Gear, well, Rising series specifically, but Metal Gear Solid. Yeah, um, they, they fleshed it out with characters from other mm-hmm. series because they had no choice. They didn't yeah, have exactly. enough original characters that really that they could pull from. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they did. They have Sackboy in that one. I forget. I believe. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but even then, like a lot of them were kind of like more recent ish. Fat, fat um, Princess. You, you weren't excited to use Fat Princess. Uh, I didn't even remember. This is an that. actual character name. I'm not. I'm not calling. Oh it no! Princess I know. I know. Fat. It's 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 this an actual Fat game. Princess. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. No. I um... incredible. Like you're gonna you're gonna go. Let's see. Hmm. I could play Link or Fat Princess. Uh... <laughs> I think I'll go with Link. <laughs> or like the Big Daddy from Bioshock. Oh, was he in there too? He was in there too, and you're just you're thinking. Wait, what does this even have to do with Sony? I, I think they had one of the uh, kill zone guys in there as well. They did. Um, yeah. Yes, they did. Colonel Roddick was mm. his name. I'm looking at it right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. Like kill zone. Like when you think of memorable characters, you don't think kill zone. Yeah, and no, I'm not, not, I'm not the at all. <laughs> the series is, is actually um, actually pretty good. It's pretty uh-huh. interesting. But the, there weren't really any characters in there that were memorable at, at all. Mm-hmm. So it's just kind of an odd choice. I guess they just wanted to flesh it out with with any characters that they could and didn't really think through the idea. Yeah. Um, it would only really work for them if they were able to draw in characters, iconic characters from a whole bunch of different companies and mm-hmm. bring them together. Mm-hmm. And the licensing fees on that would just be astronomical. Yeah. And yeah. that's why they didn't want to do it. Yep. And it's also the reason why I think um, Nintendo can afford to do it because Smash Bros. has been so successful that they know they're going to make a profit on it. And so yeah. they're, they're willing now to license characters like you know Mega Man and Pac-Man. Um, you know, Sonic is back again. I've heard uh, like one of those leaks that came out that you know the, the leaks seem to have been pretty accurate, but I'm not sure how accurate this next part is. But apparently they're planning on having uh, DLC characters. Um, including a couple of returning characters. I think Ice Climbers has been omitted um, from the uh, core roster, but might be DLC. Um, Gandorf might be coming back. Snake, which I really hope um, Snake comes back. I um, hope when Ice Climbers comes back, because I actually enjoyed playing as Ice Climbers. Mm-hmm. It's kind of an interesting character. Have that like you know unique dynamic with the, with the two characters that you controlled, and you could kind of have double damage, but at the same time, if you lose one, you really, really have a, have a hard time staying in. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, it's, uh, they have kind of a similar idea to that in um, Rosalina and Luma. Um, Luma is like one of your big ways of attacking with Rosalina, and Luma can actually get knocked out. And so if you're missing Luma, you're handicapped significantly. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so it seems like an Ice Climbers esque sort of deal where if you kind of know how to manage the two characters well, um, you can be pretty uh, potent. So um, I think it's about time for us to start wrapping things up. Um, what do you have coming up uh, as far as articles and stuff like that, Jim? Is there anything you're looking into? Um, yeah, actually, I'm I'm trying to sort of shift a little shift focus a little bit into some of the new media areas because. Um, I found some of that interesting lately. Mm-hmm. Um, I have been, I've had, had some time to kind of look at these uh, different avenues of, of presentation. Um, one of them that I'm, I'm starting to look at right now is this thing called the uh, Nightwing, the series, mm-hmm. which is actually a kind of a fan project that was actually funded through Kickstarter. And as far as I'm aware, um, they have no legal rights actually to the two any DC characters oh. <laughs> yet they're using DC characters huh. um, and they went through Kickstarter to get funding and the interesting thing is that they're completely non-profit they're mm-hmm. only using the funding um, they didn't get much I think they got about 30,000 um, they're only using the funding to help pay for um, you know like the, the fees to use a certain area to shoot or to, to, for costumes and that sort of thing mm-hmm. so um, they're still using um, volunteers for actors and things like that they're not really putting the money in there so it's it's going to be very interesting because the first episode only came out um, a couple days ago, mm-hmm. and the next episode is due. It's it's a three episode uh, short, like they're each about eight, eight minutes long. The next episode is due on Monday, and so it looks like they're going to be dropping these every week. Um, and I'll be interested to see if DC, or I should I should more accurately say Warner Brothers, since mm-hmm. they own DC, right. and they'll be the ones that will raise a stink over it. Um, if they'll just let this go because it is sort of gaining some momentum in um, social media, it's been all over a bunch of comic book sites. Mm-hmm. It'd be interesting to see if they've let, let them go through because they're just presenting these for free on YouTube. Mm-hmm. They're not asking for any money. They're not advertising. They're not really making money through advertisements. Mm-hmm. However, they are using licensed characters. So it's kind of interesting to see where DC will go with this. Now, you would know better than I, is this um, a fairly iconic IP within the DC yes. universe? Uh, okay. Well, let me put it this way. Um, mm-hmm. Nightwing was Robin. Which of oh, course is I see. Batman sidekick. So okay. yes. So okay. this is like one of the most iconic. Plus they're using villains like Deathstroke, which is a very it's another very iconic. Funny. Yeah. So um, it's the sort of thing where yes, they're not using Batman or Superman, but they are using a pretty big character mm-hmm. that certainly is well known and people associate with uh, with DC Comics. Right. So we'll kind of see where that one goes. Um, the other thing I, I, I kind of have been wanting to discuss. Um, have you seen the the uh, Crouching Tiger, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon? It's a martial, martial arts film. Uh, yes, I have. Um, in fact, I think I've seen a couple of different versions, um, like kind of like the old school and like a more modern version. Um, There's uh, just one version, so I don't know. Oh, is there? Oh, yeah, okay. I don't know. Maybe maybe we're talking about a different movie. This is the one by uh, by Ang Lee that was in theaters. I I'm, kind of got I'm, pretty pretty big actually. I'm certain I've seen it. Maybe what I saw was like a repackaged release or something like that. That's possibly true. Yeah. A lot of times they'll repackage these um, mm-hmm. when they air them in um, China and Hong Kong versus mm-hmm. when they air them um, overseas. They'll have kind of a different version um, that normally the the U S. Um, U.S. release, North American release will maybe trim off 10, 15 minutes. Mm. I'm not sure on that, um, so I'd have to I'd have to look into that. Um, but basically, they're going to do a sequel to this movie, um, but it's going to be produced by Netflix. Right, and aren't and, they um, aren't they releasing it alongside the theater release on Netflix? Yes, it's going to be exactly the same day. Mm. So you can choose. You can go. Well, do I want to go to the theater and watch? Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon 2, mm-hmm. or do I want to stay home and watch it on Netflix? And it's an interesting choice because it is. Um, well, so far, so far, actually, from what I've from what I've been reading, um, only IMAX theaters are going to have um, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon 2. Huh. So at least if you go see it, you're going to be seeing it in a very massive screen, right. um, a very different sort of atmosphere than just a regular small theater. Mm-hmm. So maybe that will draw people in. Um, I can say that when I have had the um, the opportunity to see martial art films in theaters, which is unfortunately not as often as I'd like, I normally have to watch them on DVD. Mm-hmm. But for example, when I saw recently The Raid 2 in theaters, um, that's a great experience. And it was a much better experience than watching it at home cool. um, on DVD because you're around all these people that get so excited for all of the right. um, the action moments and get so excited and, and really get into it. And, and the um, sound is going to be you know louder and more visceral and that oh sort yeah. of stuff, so it's oh more yeah. impactful. So I'm still not even sure, though, where I'm going to watch the movie. Mm. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see. Um, I wasn't. I wouldn't say I'm the biggest Crack the Tiger, Hidden Dragon fan. I think the film got a lot of credit because it was one of the first that was brought over with the... Um, uh, the uh, I don't want to mispronounce this. I'm just going to say 
the more sort of operatic um, flying around on wires yeah, um, yeah. you know effects that were not really big um, in the West but they had been well known over in Hong Kong for sure. a long, long time mm -hmm. so it kind of popularized that over here and kind of let us know that what they were doing with special effects so that's kind of why it got so big it's still it's still a good good film um, but they're actually not going to bring back um, director Ang Lee they're going to bring in uh, Yuen Wu Ping, who's kind of a very well-known martial arts director who's been around since um, the 70s. Okay. So it'll be kind of interesting to see. They are going to bring back um, Michelle Yeoh, who was the, the female lead in uh, Crouching Tiger. Okay. So it'll be interesting to see um, what other characters they decide to bring in, what the story is going to be like. Um, but most importantly, where people are going to be watching, because I know there's some theaters that are absolutely refusing to sh to show the film yeah they're, they're um, raising a stink about like oh it's stealing our business but yeah and in uh, a way it, in, in on the one hand it kind of is but on the other hand that's the exact same arguments that theaters made when television started yeah yep. and tell and they always kind of came out with something to to um to entice people to come mm -hmm. to the theater like uh cinemascope like mm -hmm. the you know wider vision um they, you know, the 3D, I mean, all of, all 3D, kind of, it was there, it went away, it came back. Mm -hmm. That's all just trying to get people to come into theaters and, and give them some sort of a gimmick or reason yeah. to see it. And if nothing else, I mean, you know, Netflix is the one producing this, so um, whether intentionally or not, all this fuss that's being raised about this now is essentially promoting the film, and now everyone's going to want to go see the film one way or the other. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, hey, it's free advertising. <laughs> so Yeah, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Yep. Yeah, so what I've got coming up myself, um, I'm planning on writing a uh, feature article this weekend over um, crossovers, um, as we've been talking about a bit today, um, kind of taking a look at um, the crossovers I've been playing recently, because it occurred to me that like each of the new games that I've bought within the past month has been a crossover, and I've been really enjoying them, um, and kind of talking about you know the art of creating a crossover, kind of like which franchises tend to work well together, what style of games tend to work well together, um, if there are genres that tend to um, work better for crossovers, and uh, kind of how you can um, take the best of both series to make a product that um, might be better overall than either one of them uh, individually. So I'll be talking a little bit about that, um, kind of building on some of the points that we've mentioned here. Um, so yeah, we're about out of time. So thank you once again, everyone, for joining us for uh, the Backward Compatible Podcast number 11. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm Jim. And we'll see you guys next time. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. We bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us about your favorite and least favorite crossovers, and which ones you'd like to see in the future. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.